Hello everyone again and um, welcome back. So now we have a session on teacher education. Now one of the main focuses for this conference this year is the question of um, process and product, um, experiential process drama and theatre performance, which and these two things are often seen as as opposed even. And I don't think Dorothy ever saw them as opposed. I think she saw a continuum that you will be shifting continually across this continuum. But I think that what has happened in the UK or certainly in England, Scotland too, is that Dorothy has become something of a marginalized figure associated with process while the curriculum, certainly the exam curriculum in drama is dominated by theater skills or performance elements. And one of the uh, things I'd like to see happen is that Dorothy's work goes back into the center and the drama teachers in secondary schools see that Dorothy can provide the keys because the basic elements such as the use of sign as a building block for all the work that we do in theater. And that was so key and so central to what Dorothy was about and what Dorothy did. So I'm very pleased to introduce three um, people who are now dealing with these kind of issues in their own work in teacher training. And although um, the issues that they might be discussing as sort of um, focused on England and Scotland, I think many of the things they're saying will be valid in other contexts as well. We do have places where the curriculum is changing, where it's changed so much in Wales, and so there are different issues there. And some great developments are happening, but at the same time, in many countries, there is a, a kind of constraint that teachers feel because of the, the curriculum that they're working with. So maybe the three of you could just introduce yourselves. Over to you. I'll start. I'm Theo Breyer, and I work on an English and Drama PGCE um, at the Institute of Education. We're part of UCL now, and that's where we are today. So that's why I was teaching my student teachers how to teach grammar <laughs> um, this morning. I'm glad that's done. And um, so over to Amanda. I'm Amanda Kipling and I'm PGCE Drama Lead at Goldsmiths. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much, Theo, for setting things up here today. It's a very much needed conference. And I'm Will Barlow and I'm uh, the PGDE um, Coordinator for Drama Education at the University of Aberdeen. Could you hear us all clearly? Yeah, thank you, Karen. I could hear <laughs> you very well, yes. Hello, Nick. Hello, people. So just also to introduce Iris and Jessica, our technical team, and Tomas, who will be monitoring um, comments in the chat and any questions you have, please put them in the chat. Um, with these three presenters today, I think my job is going to be just to try and keep things on track. And try, <laughs> we do have an agenda. <laughs> and so uh, we'll see how we stick to it. And... First of all, we thought we would uh, look at the question of curriculum. And I think, Amanda, you were going to... Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll kick that. off with this. Um, I've been a drama teacher since the mid 80s. And I was just thinking, you know, since that time, what have been the big hits? on drama in the curriculum and of course the first one that was massive was the national curriculum and in secondary schools there was I remember there was a fear of oh we're not on it it's all part of English are we going to lose our jobs um, and in fact that didn't happen that didn't happen drama, drama carried on drama was still popular at GCSE still popular at A level uh, it made sense for us to hold hands with the English department a little bit, uh, but otherwise we came through that fairly unscathed. But where the big hit did come, I feel, was in primary, because back in the mid 80s, primary school teachers were taught that really, really difficult skill of how to harness a child's natural learning. And Viv was mentioning this earlier, 
all children play. That is the motorway through the brain. And very skilled primary school teachers could harness that and get the curriculum to travel through that motorway rather than trying to force a curriculum in through the back alleys. And because of the nature of the national curriculum, that very quickly started to erode in primary. And they, you found this more um, lesson by lesson, subject by subject, more akin to the, well, a secondary um, diet would feel like. And drama, ironically, having been a major driver of the curriculum and the carrier of it through all the play-based strategies that hold it together, oddly found itself as a subject that there wasn't any time for. So it got lost as a drama medium and as a process for actually carrying the drama. And with it went the art form. Because as you said uh, just a few minutes ago, David, that really if you're teaching good drama, good theatre emerges from that. The two actually do swim together, just as Dorothy uh, always uh, always uh, promoted so then the that so that was a double whammy and there was a third one of course because of the impact it had on initial teacher education and now finding courses that really seriously address the dynamics and the pedagogy that, that is play-based is very very hard to find and I would argue quite strongly that we desperately need to see that come back uh, then some years pass, we have the cuts, we see drama obviously being cut when the money uh, isn't there anymore, or rather when a drama teacher leaves, they're not replaced. And then the next double whammy comes under the E back and the G, what's happened to the GCSE and A level. But we will be talking about assessment later, so I'm just going to mention that here um, and uh, pass on to colleagues. Um, yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree that um, through the different iterations, so Amanda and I have shared what well, I started my career at the beginning of the national curriculum and um, as a drama association, uh, the drama teachers association that I was involved with, that was uh, a big, a big issue, whether or not we stood against the national curriculum or whether we would um, with, whether we would agree um, with, with that kind of with with the ways that it was organized so that dra drama drama was part of English was not distinctive it but actually throughout my career I found that we had a degree of freedom um it became much more it became much more focused on the GCSE and the GCSE stood by as a result of not being part of the national curriculum although the arts arts council and other people tried to kind of provide a structure and a, a, and something that was more you know, uh, uh, universal across schools um in in this country anyway um and the, and currently our concern is that the GCSE syllabi is so reductive and that it gives no that there's no account for the for the for drama medium as an intellect and working with the drama medium as an intellectual pursuit in itself because it's now 70 percent written a written response because that's all that is valued and that's all that is makes the subject academic and when I think of Hethcote's work I think her work it's 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 all about the ideas. It's about it's about a, 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 a met, what she calls a meticulously selective approach that really is encouraging young people to think so carefully about the signs and the ways that they make meaning, about slowing things down, slowing down uh, time or, or that that the processes of uh, well, it, it's not really living through. It's living through at a pace that enables everybody to reflect on choices and decisions in an artistic way. Um, and that's, and what I see in classrooms, in drama classrooms now is much more about what gesture would this actor use? So, uh, or, or that, yeah, so coming at it from such a different, different approach. Anyway, over to Will. Yeah, and there's lots of, parallels between the Scottish curriculum and the English curriculum and particularly how uh, uh, we started. So in Scotland, the curriculum uh, was like with, uh, it was embedded, well not embedded, but it worked alongside the English curriculum. Particularly, we came into this idea of speech and language 
and then under uh, a lady called uh, Catherine Hollingworth, who uh, was a proponent for child drama. And the, the, it started off through that lens and we've systematically swung from a more child drama social development of a child to more of a positivist approach to, um, as to say, like um, put on a play and we'll address how you're using your gesture and your voice, et cetera. And that. So then become this continuum from drama into more theatre um, and even the curriculum itself right now. Um, uh, the secondary curriculum, we, we would have a situation where the broad general education aspect of that, at the start from S1 to S3, still dealing with the more um, like uh, child-centred kind of approaches. And then there's a big jump into the hard learning, which is about uh, putting on plays. Um, so I'm uh, using that hard learning in quotation marks there. Um, but the, the, the idea there that there is um, this notion that the the easier element is stuff that we're not getting we're dealing with the child's the child development stuff and then the harder stuff's when the the real learning comes in when you have to learn how to use your voice and have to learn how to learn lines and put on plays and uh, where to stand on a stage and how to recite what a teacher's told you to say so there is there's questions there about how that's how that's come about and um there's it worries me that that's the the mode that we have um i don't want to say accepted it but we've had to work in this kind of curricular constraints that that is the view that what uh theater uh theater and drama is in order to be assessed so there are some parallels there from both of our mm. sectors both our countries yeah yeah well, I know you're all sending students out into the uh, classrooms and you, there's also a question of the the relationship then with the teachers in the schools that you're working with. And, and obviously there might be that you're trying to introduce certain things and then the students go out into these schools and they find different demands or teachers with a very different perspective. So maybe we could talk a little bit. Theo, I think you're going to lead on this. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the teachers who are mentors in schools, I can see Nick laughing at me there. <laughs> um, a lot of them are my ex-student teachers. Um, and yeah, and uh, we have a close relationship with schools and with drama departments. And I'm not in the business of making a judgment. I'm just relieved. I know that I would have to teach in the ways that the GCSE syllabi is framed. There's not really much way around it um, because it's so narrow. Uh, but I, I do try, but I think that, that it's really important that there's a distinctive key stage three curriculum. And that's something which, you know, I'll talk to school colleagues about. I think the ways that we that, that, that we really cement the relationship with partnership schools, and this is so important at the moment because we're going through this process of re-accreditation where, um, as has happened at different stages in the past, the government are trying to move um, the responsibility for teacher education into schools because they don't trust us <laughs> uh, for various reasons. And luckily, I mean, well, one of the things that we did today, uh, this, this term um, to experiment a bit more with that was to take a project into school where I worked in Nick's classroom with his students and my student teachers around a Shakespeare project. And so rather than, um, I think for our for the students to see and embodying how we might take an approach that is more experiential, that is more starting with uh, the students making meaning rather than the teacher telling them what Shakespeare means. Um, I think that that is very valuable for them. As Hethgate says, you know, it's not, it's it's about experience. That's what matters rather than rather than telling students what they need to learn. They need to uh, experience it. I was talking to my students this morning about grammar in that vein. The other thing that we do every year and have done for decades is a theatre and education project, which is all about role. It's all about thinking about the relationship between assuming a role and learning. Um, uh, and it's a kind of drama lesson with five, you know, four or five or six teachers. They go into their, their partnership schools. And at that point, um, the teachers in schools 
observe their students interacting in these ways. And it, and it becomes often there's a sort of dialogue that emerges from that. Oh, we could we could do more of that. Or it's a shame we can't do more of this. I, you know, I wish there was more space. I wish there was more space for that kind of dialogue. But I don't feel that it I, I don't feel that there's a huge gulf between us. I, I know we understand each other and we're finding we're finding ways of um yeah, I mean, that obviously we have more freedom and our students come back and they say, that's not how I can do that in school, but particularly in English. There is more freedom in drama, but particularly in English. And we just say, you know, you mediate, you do what you can. <laughs> um, and um, it's about the teacher that you want to become. And maybe one day we can change things and you can be that teacher. But we have to be realistic about the context and the pressures that uh, you know, our student teachers are working with and teachers in school, uh, you know, particularly after the pandemic, people behind desks, but they still have their imagination. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, I talked rather a lot there. Over to you, Amanda. Uh, yeah, well, I think you said a lot of it, actually, Theo. I think um, what, we've still got freedom to teach the child in key stage three. Yeah. I think that's the, the key message. We're still able to look at a group of children and train our, educate our students into learning how to sum up what they need rather than just doing the next scheme of work on the, on the curriculum. And um, you could, out of the, out of the filing cabinet, uh, and you know, this idea of reshaping it or moving things around and being flexible uh, so that you're still ready for key stage four if they want to take it at key stage four. And of course, we've got dwindling numbers at key stage four, which is a real concern. Um, that that's really where we can still dance and really um, ad address children's needs and interests and help them grow as people, meaning making actually the perception through going into roles, seeing the world through all different perspectives uh, and getting them excited about the subject, whether or not they do take it at GCSE. Yeah. Um, and um, what I'm finding in my schools is that this is what this is what um, mentors actually agree with and want to. However, they are obliged to have schemes of work that look as though they are marching towards the GCSE. Hmm. So mime, facial expressions, still images, those sort of things come up again and again because they're the tick boxable things when it comes to assessment. But what is actually going on in lots of cases is quite dynamic. And I do find mentors often saying to me, I'm so glad I've got a student because having a student that comes from, um, you know, PGCE programmes, they're constantly challenging that model and they're helping me find new ways of doing things or different ways or reminding me about why it was I stopped doing something that was such a good idea all those years ago because we do get swept along and it's a very powerful tide. So, yes, um, mentors say to me it's like a form of ongoing CPD having a student which I think is a really healthy thing to be seen being said. It's a shame we can't do much about key stage four and key stage five but there you go. Um, in Scotland in particular regarding the relationship so um, there's only two institutions in Scotland which educate drama uh, teachers which is Aberdeen and Edinburgh so um, I have a responsibility for 50% of all drama educators in the country. And that um, in order to place those students, we don't have ownership of, of that. We've got no locus in that. That's done by the General Teaching Council of Scotland, where the SPSS um, uh, places a student within an hour and a half of their locale. Now, obviously, that means uh, could, they could be placed anywhere in the country. So for relationship and partnership building, um, it's rather it's rather difficult because I don't know where the students are going and I've got no say in where the students are going. So they could be going to one school which could have a approach which I agree or disagree with and it could go to another school where I agree or disagree with as well. So uh, you've got no say in that. Um, which brings its challenges um, because the students are getting a, a particular uh, understanding of what drama education is and what it could be and then there's a uh, the community the, the, the continuum when they go to school might not align to what they're being suggested to in uh, university 
So there is there's work to be done on that. Um, and how we do that, we're still trying to work it. There's been lots of reports. There's the Donaldson report that's been put out onto that as well to try and figure out how we can solve that problem. But there's there it also raises questions to me about uh, in ways in which teacher education and initial teacher education and um, has been undertaken, but also about the CLPL or the CPD for teachers throughout their profession as well. How are we supporting and what responsibility do we have as educators and as teacher educators in the university sector and the academy to support teachers through their ongoing CLPL? Uh, and it raises from what uh, my two colleagues have also said about regarding the curriculum and a lot of teachers may go, yeah, but well, you're wanting to us to do a lot more process-based work and all that stuff with this, but ultimately we have to get these children to to put on a play at the end of the year. That's what we need to work towards. And they're finding it hard to try and square that as well. So there's there's work to be done there and that. And I think the curriculum's also got an a, a aspect to play in our relationship with, with schools as well and how we are understanding the curriculum and how we are questioning the curriculum as well too, how uh, school staff are um, trying to navigate it mm -hmm. actually with our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to say, I, I learned so much going into school. It's this time of year when I start going into school again, and I am desperate to be back in the classroom. I learned so much from mentors and, and school colleagues. I have, yeah, I, so, it, but I don't think any of us, we're, not, we're critiquing the system, but not our no, colleagues. Yeah, so I know, Will, you and I were talking about possibly doing uh, the next start of the Hethford Conference in Aberdeen. So hopefully this might make an intervention in the situation up there. Yeah. Um, and there's also, of course, the thorny question of, of assessment. Um, when I'm training teachers in using Mount of the Expert, I'm often asked, well, how do we assess this? And I have to admit that it's not something that I need to worry about because I'm not a teacher in a school. I'm training teachers, but I'm practicing in schools, going in with projects rather than being there and having to deal with all the issues of curriculum and assessment. And so my situation is lucky, but this is always a big question, assessment. And of course, built into the system is assessment and what needs to be. And so much of our education system now is driven to by this question of, the final assessments, the exams and so on. So Amanda, I think again, you're going to comment on this first. Yes, yes. Um, the end, the last thing I said was key stage four and five, where, yeah, well, there you go. Well, where are we going really? Um, yes, we've had uh, another big hit that we had was the e back. We don't feature on it, but we're not alone there. The arts are completely abandoned, you know, when it came to the e back. So we've got colleagues in other arts areas that are beginning to feel the same sort of pinch that we are when it comes to GCSE and A-level numbers. Um, uh, sorry, um, Amanda, could you just explain EBAC? Oh, the Which EBAC, that, that's, um, and that's a, a special um, qualification that you gain if you get a certain combination of GCSEs. They're made up of, um, you have to have English and maths, and there has to be a, a modern language, there has to be a humanity, science. and a science, there's a collection, but there's no, there's no column for the arts. So that's had huge implications for um, uh, the, the way things pan out at GCSE, uh, because uh, students who are seen as more academic, uh, schools on they're, they're they're measured by their EBAC results and so your more academic students and I can't actually think of a more academic subject than theatre if you think about its worldliness and its depth and its breadth but again there you go um if they're not actually featured you know in there your st those students tend to get steered to, away from the arts so that they can beef up the EBAC uh, results um, which of course have got implications for all sorts of things like uh, inclusion, etc. So um, that that was a big blow to all the arts uh, and drama, of course, and it's had its impact across the arts with the, the options at GCSE and A level, as I mentioned earlier, which are dwindling. Now. For me, this does actually have some very profound implications about the, where this is not going. 
because already university departments, art departments, their numbers are dropping. If they mm -hmm. haven't done it at A level, you're kind of closing the door towards going on to doing it at university. This is really becoming an attack on thinking and democracy. And I think drama in particular, if you go back to your medieval theater and that marvelous triumph of the common man uh, and, the, and the, the pageant wagons and the battle that they won um, for freedom of speech is now seriously under threat. And I think that's something that should alarm us all very much. Uh, because if we start closing these uh, courses at universities, then we've got a, a serious threat. On, it, it becomes an attack on thinking. Um, so there are various studies that show how valuable it is. I, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about the, the, the head teachers um, study that came out some years ago now. Chris Lawrence, my colleague there, will remember us talking about this. A school without drama is a school without a soul. Mm. I was so, so heartened to hear the reference to all the spirituality in that opening section that we had today about this is this is about heart and soul and, and flesh and blood. This isn't just about exam results. And um, of course, the Lisbon key competencies, which show the benefits that are long lasting for youngsters in their future lives that go on and on, regardless of whether they do GCSE or whether they're on the EVAC or not. You know, the bigger picture is, is vast and that's being swept away if, if we don't do something about it. Yeah, I'll just briefly add, I think we need, we, we started to with uh, last year with a campaign around getting rid of GCSE and that seemed to be something that as a drama teachers association that, I, that I'm involved with that seemed to be our, our focus that need seemed to be what we needed to be worried about getting rid of the whole of GCSEs and it seemed that there was a moment around the pandemic and uh, the fact that they couldn't take their exams that that should have happened because you know this country is an outlier uh, in the, in England in having um, um, formal exams at 16 and um at the end of the school now that students have to stay into school to 18 19 so it just um it seems to me that, that the impact of the impact of the amount of pressure on young people that has exercised through these processes of, of public exams of assessment is really we're seeing it now in the mental health issues that are such that are so i mean i see it with my student teachers coming through who've been come through this system where um have, have hyper accountability where exams are everything exams are everything for the school profile exams you know uh, really lead all kinds of learning in a way that is really injurious to to young people and to us as they as as uh, you know, I'm speaking as a parent, but also as, a, as an educator, and we have to change, that has to change. And drama, I always think that drama, you know, when year seven start in their first secondary school, they should be doing drama and playing football for two weeks, and then they'd be fine. And it, it, the role that it has to play, you know, when I started, when I started on my PGCE, uh, you know, Bolton's text, drama as education, or drama at the centre of the curriculum, that's where we've thought that things would be going, and there is still a place for that. We have to hang on to that possibility. Um, assessment, uh, uh, assessment is one thing that I think about quite a lot um, in my own work. Um, uh, particularly in Scotland, we have one examination board, the Scottish Qualifications Authority. So we have this homogenised board who dictate what the examination system is and um, uh, for the um, accredited like, national five higher and advanced higher qualifications, you're equivalent to uh, A-levels and GCSE. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, we've we've got, a, we've got quite a... We've got quite a big issue and I'm talking about secondary education in particular not primary education because we've got a broad general education that takes us up from um, age of three up to about 11 for when children, uh, 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 sorry up to um, 13, 14 um, into the uh, lower ends of, um, sorry the, the initial start of secondary school so the first three years of secondary school is still part of the broad general education. I'm not going to talk about that, I'm going to talk about the um, accreditation phase for the SQA. 
Now, for me, the the races there's almost like a, an oversimplification of what we're doing. So, like there's the target setting, there was the um, testing and um, um, inspections and like uh, principal assessors reports, etc. For that, and if we look at the the qualification itself, so the national five qualification uh, can can only be externally assessed. And the National 4 qualification is internally assessed. This is really important. So the National 4 qualification is basically what the children um, or the young people create themselves. So work that they, they get a stimulus and they create work that has meaning to them. They meaning make themselves from that stimulus itself. A National 5, which is externally assessed uh, by the SQA, is about a play. And it's about, uh, uh, it has greater weight both in schools and into the wider population and the demographic of the public, and for qualifications going on to higher in university. So the, what we're seeing is where the, the curriculum has created this divide between what they're viewing almost as high art, as in this is a play, and this is a play that has to be done, which the child doesn't get to pick. The teacher picks the play. The teacher directs the child. The teacher, um, uh, the child doesn't have get to see. The teacher casts what the child is going to be played in. So the child doesn't even get an opportunity to, to say who they, he or she or they wish to play. They then are blocked by the teacher and then they're assessed on how they're using their voice, etc. what the teacher's directed. Now, if you think about a teacher here, a teacher will have on average about two National 5 classes. Each class will have about, they'll have to do about four plays. So they'll have, they'll be broken into groups. And so they're probably about four, four groups in a class. That's four plays a teacher has to direct. Multiply that by, by two, and that's eight plays for to do in one year. <laughs> then they're in hand to do higher, so higher's got to do multiple scenes. So say there's 20 kids in a higher class, that means there's 40 scenes that have got to do. Now, I don't know any repertory theatre director that would have to direct <laughs> that much, but we're expecting that of drama teachers to do. And then it becomes a question about what are we then, what are we then asking the drama teacher to do? What skill set are we requiring of a drama teacher? And the principal assessor wrote in the report that those children who were poorly directed, um, their grades were negatively impacted. So at which point we're now, are we okay. assessing the teacher or are we assessing the child? Mm -hmm. And that, 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 that raises questions about if we're going down this Hornbrook approach to the curriculum, and we're assessing that, that mode of learning, then who are we actually assessing? Because the child doesn't have any autonomy, there's no agency. There's, you could argue where's the child's creativity in that process as well. But it's very, very limited. But in fact, what we're then doing is putting the emphasis onto the teacher and their creativity, their direction. Direction itself doesn't even get brought in until higher. So at no point can a child even begin to have, you're not teaching them direction at any other point in the curriculum until they get to higher. So you're going, the only person that can do that is a teacher, but the teacher doesn't have any skills in that or the skill sets might be lacking then the SQ are actively telling us that that negatively impacts children's grades. I don't know any curriculum in the subject, in any subject in the curriculum where we're assessing a teacher uh, as opposed to we're assessing a pupil. And that is a problem with going down this Hornbrook, potential this Hornbrook approach to drama education and secondary education. Well, um, I'm sure that this is resonating with people in other countries as well. Um, I've seen a comment in the chat from Christina in Greece, for example. So I think we can open this up shortly to hear about other people's experiences in other countries. But I'm sure that, again, in many contexts, there is this problem that I that Dorothy herself talked about, that we, we burden children so much with over their information, not information that is important for them and immediately it's up over there it's all happening over there not in their own world in their own time um we're in a crisis aren't we and certainly in schools at the moment not just in drama in education but in education generally who'd like to open up on this question where are we in terms of teacher numbers and so on i just was noticing in the chat uh jeff Redmond saying, yeah, 40% reduction in GCSE near level entry since 20, 2010. Uh, and these, yeah, looking at the Morecambe Bay curriculum, we haven't got a Welsh representative here. Well, that's no, not Morecambe Bay, is it? But yeah, that sounds in, but also Wales has a different, we, we have to be clear, there are different curricula. Um, what's the other, John Rayner saying about 
Yeah, given the current situation in the UK, critical thinkers are the last thing that school managers want. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So good point. And there's somebody asking for advice about process theatre concepts. Yes, maybe that's something to come. We'll come back to. But 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 sorry to come back, David. I just wanted to acknowledge the things that that are going on because it's very very relevant. But sorry, your question again. Remind us again what our focus was. Crisis. About the crisis, yeah, there's a te there is a teacher recruitment crisis at the moment. It was kind of um, during the pandemic. People teachers didn't move school. Uh, and then they've been moving again. I, I mean, in London, it's particular. I mean, really, a real crisis. Um, somebody, somebody in a school that I know who teaches in a school down the road from me says that he doesn't see how the school will continue to function after Christmas because so many and teachers are leaving in the middle of the year um, because of the pressures of uh, what, what, what exactly. Although it's in a different country, but exactly what you were saying, Will, about how teachers, teachers themselves, are feeling. Uh, that, 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 that they're the ones that are being well they're they're the ones subject to offset inspection but also the pressures to do with this kind of not being able I I actually I'm not a teacher at the moment in school I'm not, I wonder whether Nick or, or somebody who's in in school at the moment would have something to say about about this the crisis as it's as it's manifesting in in schools in in London say or Nick are you able to comment on anything there Oh, because in, in in some ways I I know the figures and I know the hearsay and I know the fact that my PGC PGC which is because it's come under the umbrella of English we've always had a bursary which was taken away during pandemic and post pandemic but now is back again fifteen grand for next year which is an indicator of the government con government concern about lack of English teachers particularly and but they're less concerned about drama teachers but. I know that in some schools, the drama teacher leaves, the subject disappears. Nick, do, is there anything you would want to add to that? Nick, if you want to unmute. Hello, please. everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I was just unmuting. Um, really interesting to hear. And I think I would definitely echo a lot of what I've heard from others as well. I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's certainly the case um, in terms of what I hear from um, colleagues in other schools as well, that there are so many challenges. And I think as well as recruitment, which is something that um, you were talking about that there, there is also the retention of staff and uh, in ensuring that lots of teachers are able to continue in the work that they're doing rather than leaving as well, because um, I think both sides of that are incredibly important in the experiences that people have. Yes, and, and the early career framework, which has been introduced for teachers in this, which was introduced by partly by Becky Francis, who used to run the Institute. And I remember arguing with her about it. The idea that it was supposed to encourage um, teachers to stay in the profession. So two years as a as a, a as a new teacher as opposed to one, but so reductive and so and does it not recognize not recognizing that actually as you're learning to teach that that your, your immediate location, the school that you're in, that the, the people who are around you, your community, those are the people you'll learn from, as opposed to generalise being told how to be a teacher. But sorry, over to you two. Well, no, I think, I think you've said a lot about it really already. I mean, I've been doing um, PGC now, for this is my 17th year, and I was totting it up last night. I think I have, I have been, uh, it's been my, pleasure and my privilege to have been working with uh, about nearly it must be about 200 teachers now and I'm very pleased to say that most of them I know where they are and what they're doing and most of them are still in schools some of them are now senior management in schools uh, some of them have left schools but are still working in theatre education departments things like that very very few I think less than 10 have actually left teaching right but I know that that is unusual across the board it really is so I think drama teachers tend to be stayers and I think it's because we've had despite everything you say which I completely agree mm. with we're still the lucky ones in the staff room in that yeah. we do have that bit of autonomy left. yeah and I think that's, that's true I think that is a, a, a key reason why they stay having mm. said that though in the last few weeks I have noticed students from only three four years ago sending me emails i'm quitting teaching and it is starting to happen to us mm. and i'm um, it deeply saddens me uh, 
because for such a long time we've hung on in there, we've been stayers, we've managed to weather the storm. Um, who knows whether we can carry on hanging on long enough for the wind to change. And um, crisis, um, so for teacher recruitment in Scotland um, are set by the Scottish Government who decide how many teachers we have to um, educate. So we will be fined if we don't meet our targets and we'll be fined if we go over our targets as well. So <laughs> and that's part for workforce planning, um, which government will decide how many drama teachers I need to enroll each year. So on average, I'll take about 20 on average drama teachers a year. And that's a very, very competitive course to get into. So I'll probably interview anywhere between 80 and 100 students to, to have 20 uh, in, in place. You've got to remember, though, there are only two institutions in Scotland. So I think we're talking in total about 40 drama teachers coming uh, to be to be educated each year. Now, in that, they have their 36 week of university education. And I think this is really an important point. We have fought, and I do mean fought, against a teach first, a school direct model in Scotland. And we have retained our um, a university led teacher education. But um, and I, I would I, I will continue to fight for that um, because, as John has already done, we are teaching critical thinkers. and. We are their teachers are public intellectuals and uh, I feel strongly about that um, what we do though it's a it is a two-year course so they do one year with me uh, and my colleagues um, and then they do they're guaranteed a job for one year on their probation year so that probation year they will be paid full-time uh, but only work at 0.8 of a timetable so they're guaranteed a 0.8 of a timetable but they're given a full-time job essentially salary for the year and then after that year then they have to then try and find a place of work the problem is that there's been there's and i'm doing research on this right now but the faculties in schools so we've lost pt subject leads and have now gone on to faculties faculty so you would have a faculty head of expressive arts say who might be an art teacher and that art teacher might be in charge of music and drama and art so the promotion opportunities now for teachers has dwindled. So we don't have APTs, we don't have um, uh, assistant, um, like a, a charter teacher, that status has gone as well. So all those layers of management have gone, layers of promotion prospects have gone, it's been streamlined. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm presenting work in that next week at CIRA as well uh, on that data. But the it's it's, so for, for me, for a drama educator, we're going, we can get teachers and we've got to meet these quotas, but then how do they then keep them in after that one year? After that one year, where are the job proper opportunities for them? Uh, and that that that's that worries me. I mean, that does worry me because we, we've got to train, we've got to educate, not train, we've got to educate them, but then where are the opportunities for jobs for them after that as well? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but th there's... Uh, teaching is a difficult profession and it's a hard profession and um, I think we need to recognise that uh, teachers do a very very difficult job and yeah. uh, in very trying circumstances uh, particularly also because I would argue that the curriculum doesn't make it easy for them either I don't think the curriculum is a particularly easy thing for teachers to work in at times and I'm also meaning the extracurriculum and the hidden curriculum as well there um, as well, so as well as the formal curriculum. Um, well, I think David, David, sorry, could I? I just thought one thing that I haven't also really stressed is 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 that actually only ninety nine out of the one hundred and forty one, I think, um, institutions are actually able to carry on doing teacher education from next year. And Karen yeah. may be able to comment further on Karen Hall, maybe in this country, Karen Hall may be able to comment further on that because that's something that we shouldn't overlook. It is shocking. Um, Karen, could you say something briefly about that? Would you mind? Yeah, so every teacher training provider in England has had to go through accreditation, uh, accreditation, I can't even say it, I'm so angry, uh, the accreditation process with the Department for Education. Um, uh, we had to spend literally hundreds of hours, um, those of you who have been involved in it possibly will know, uh, had to spend hundreds of hours writing bids justifying why we teach your training, how we're doing it. Um, and then we got uh, all got emails saying whether or not we're going to be accredited from next year. 
um, a number of institutions, both school-based and university providers, uh, were told that way they weren't going to be accredited from 2024, which includes University of Sussex, which was a previously outstanding provider um, by Ofsted. Um, so it's not the end of the road by a long way. You know, we're looking at partnerships and doing various things. I think um, from a drama perspective is that there aren't, as you know, that many HEI institutions that are offering drama. And because of what's happened, it's meant that, um, for example, um, Sussex and Plymouth, um, you know, potentially may no longer have PGC drama places from 2024, um, which is a which will have a huge knock on effect regionally, because, for example, at Sussex, our nearest university HEI provider is Brighton and they don't do drama um, or anything like that. So it is, it is a huge blow. Um, but, but like I said, it's not the end of the road. We're building other partnerships. We will still continue to deliver um, initial teacher education in, in drama, but it might just look like it's in a slightly different, a slightly different form. Um, but I think, you know, along with the um, issues at GCSE in drama, along with arts uh, subjects having funding cuts at university, and the issues around initial teacher education, um, I think it actually gives us an even stronger argument for for what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, its importance hasn't lessened, even though those above might think it has. Agree. Solidarity to you, Karen. Yeah, yeah. I think John Reno commented in the chat is right that the system that we've got encourages not the the, not the teacher as artist, which Dorothy talked about, but the teacher as technician who is deliberately yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. the curriculum. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and before we open things up to comments from other people and different contexts that they are in, maybe we should just say, well, we can say how terrible the situation is, but what are the best ways forward now well, to change things or change things in small ways as much as we can? Any thoughts on this? This is good. What 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 you've organised, David? This here, eighty-two people together sharing. This is really important. We have to create spaces for that. Although it is hard because we're set, we're all, we're all working so hard and struggling, um, and we have to come together and uh, do what we can. And I know other people like Jeff and other people are uh, organising and trying to. There's the Drama Theatre Educators Alliance. Jeff, uh, you were at the Labour Party conference uh, with students sharing, um, stressing the important. I wrote to my um, MP about drama GCS, drama in schools and drama GCSE, and and, and uh, she got back to me and was so positive and seemed to know what I was talking about. So there are always surprises and allies out there, and we'll just have to keep going. I think. Um, what do we do? Well, I'm again I'm going to talk from the Scottish perspective here. Um, the SQA is about to go through a major overhaul and there's been major um, discussions around that. Um, so that could be good. Um, it could also... Uh, but I think there's a, a bigger question for me is that our undergraduate courses and how, uh, how what they're doing and how they're supporting um, artistry for students. And uh, what you were saying earlier on, Amanda, if we don't have it in primary, then a second do then how we're going to have it in the university, et cetera. So there's that as well. There's also, uh, for me, a question here about um, teachers. Um, when I'm speaking to teachers in schools in Scotland, there is almost like, um, well, this is just the way that we do it now. This is just the way it is, and that's how. We, and uh, I'm going well. It doesn't have to be like that. Mm. It doesn't have to be like this. And there are alternative modes if we want to do it. But unfortunately, the way the system is, it's it's post funneled us into this positivist approach to assessment, a positive approach to how we even we're viewing drama education. And uh, it worries me that um, have teachers got the voice and opportunity to actually be critical and say, well, actually, I don't want to do that. I want to try to do something. And do they know alternatives because of, um, as I say, there are only two, there are only two providers in Scotland. So I think a very process-led approach and um, the other institution might not do that. So um, then we have a, a dichotomy coming up uh, out within the country as well. So um, there, there are big questions there that, um, how do we fix it? I don't know. Um, Talking just like what you're saying is probably the best way to start off. And there's a lot that 
the, 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 I think it starts with the whole divide being processed and product as well, David, go to the very beginning of it. Like, you know, these camps has created this dichotomy mm -hmm. as well. And that doesn't, ha it's not, it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, it's, well, it's not, but it doesn't, I mean, we've spoken before at length about this, David, it's not, and it shouldn't be. Um, but that's the way the examination has enabled it to happen. And as such, then teachers then have gone into that approach because it gives validity and, and you could say, um, quality assurance uh, to it as well. So uh, there are big questions around it. Yes, the process product argument was raging when I was training. And I really did think we'd put that one to bed. <laughs> but it's, you're right, the system has actually brought it to the fore again. And it's yeah. really not a helpful yeah. Uh, yeah. dialogue for progression. It's, it's sending us backwards rather. Um, I, I asked myself uh, when considering this question, have have we any have we any allies? And oddly, um, it might seem strange for me, having said what I've said, that actually Ofsted are insisting on a broad and balanced curriculum. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether they can actually make this happen, of course, their powers are limited in terms of uh, impact on uh, educational development. Um, but that voice on our side is very helpful, and I think we need to to remember that we, we have got, as you were saying, we do have some allies. And at the moment, I've said whatever it's doing in other ways, it, it is actually trying to keep the the flag flying for the arts, and uh, we need to remember that. But I think, uh, sorry, and, uh, I think, sorry, but yeah, sorry. For, and on on Ofsted for a distinctive key stage three curriculum. Amanda Spearman did say that, that the key stage three curriculum has to be distinctive from GCSE. I mean, it's, it, the, the latest report on English was appalling, um, but uh, there has been that. Yeah, sorry, over to you. Yeah, so what, what are we actually doing? What are we assessing? Why are we assessing it? What is this assessment relevant? Is it appropriate? Is it, um, does it, is it linking to professional? What even, uh, you cannot be assessing anything exa ex for examining in Scotland, you cannot be assessing anything other than an end product in Scotland. Mm. That is it. So, where is the applied theatre practice? Where is the community education practice? Where is the opportunity to develop the social emotional development of a child? Where is that? Why is that not being valued? Why is that not achievement? Why is that not being viewed as attainment? Why have we gone through this approach? And that that really, really concerns me. It really concerns me as a drama practitioner. And this idea of like this high art of theatre and this westernised view of what theatre is as well and how we're, we've bought into that to yeah. offer us validity yeah. of a subject area. And that really concerns me. It genuinely concerns me. And I don't know what how we... We, we we shift that. I know. I mean, it's like what you were saying earlier on. Are we training out of work actors? Or are we yeah. like, is that what we're ultimately now there to? And I'm like, yeah. that's not what we're there for. It's mm. not what we're there for. Um. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I think yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, my other ally, obviously, that I was thinking of was what COVID taught us, and uh, COVID taught us that it was creative thinkers who could think outside the box. These are the ones who did not willingly jump into it. It's outside the box thinkers that we need now more than ever because of our current crises that are numerous, which I won't bother to list because we know them off by heart now. The news covers them every time it's on. But COVID, or oh, three years ago, actually showed us the importance of creative thinking because it was the creative thinkers who survived and who saved others. And that was a that was a big opportunity that there, I think, uh, tragic though it was, a terrible, terrible thing. It really did highlight the need for creative thinkers and people who could think outside the box. Mm -hmm. And it's been a real, there's an opportunity there for us to really try and bolster the push for the arts. But my final thought is going back to medieval theatre, oh, yeah. <laughs> was that when the common man was told you can't do your plays in the church anymore, and he got he got uh, extracted from ejected from the church. He and I'm sorry it's so gendered, but it was he, as far as we know, um, made another church. <laughs> they found yeah. other ways of doing it, and uh, we found that you know the arts have a habit of surviving somehow, and. You know, if, if we're really not going to find a place that's going to nurture and do this properly within an education system where it should be thriving, then maybe we need to start thinking about other ways. Mm. Mm.
what they are is another is another conference. Another day. Another day. Another day. Another day. Another day. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I often think of Dorothy's work as kind of these, um, when they're introduced into schools, it's like she's planting time bombs that will explode the school system from within. But yeah. oh, we're yeah. really using it properly. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to hear about how this has chimed in with other people's experiences in other countries. I know by Charlie, for example, you put in a comment in the chat about the Indian system and the curriculum there and, and the focus there. Did you want to come in on that by Charlie? Yes, by Charlie says in the cut in the chat, time bombs. <laughs> Do you want to unmute yourself, by Charlie? Yes, yes, I have a new question. You got your camera? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll keep my uh, video off as uh, the internet is not that great here. Okay. Great. Uh, so. Uh, what I wanted to say over here is general education, not just drama, but uh, I feel when Dorothy brings her, uh, I mean, when we bring Dorothy's system into a school, it, it just covers the entire education uh, system. It, it shakes that up. And I have faced a lot of uh, pushback from schools. Uh, the moment I try and, uh, you know, put in a little bit of uh, Dorothy here and there, it does not, it, they really uh, kind of uh, push back and they uh, they stop you from doing a lot of things. Uh, and I've got, uh, because I, I also don't teach in a school. Uh, recently I've started working in a school uh, because the management wanted to change things. But now that I see in six months down the line, uh, the management also can see the changes that drama is actually bringing and they are not very happy with it. So, <laughs> so yeah, it is, I think this is some kind of a war that we have to rage. Um, you know, something like uh, gorilla fighters go actually plant those time bombs. John, John Rainey, you've had some comments in the chat. Do you want to share that with the, with the group? about the, uh, what's, what's driving this? What's driving what were the co context that we're dealing with? David, I think we've been talking quite a lot about secondary education today, but also like primary drama education, which we've got responsibility mm -hmm. for as well. I mean, we are, Nicky Dogg and I have just put a, a, we put a survey out in Scotland to see uh, for ITE providers um, about the amount of hours which um, teachers ITE provision and for drama education in the primary sector. I mean, I mean, we were getting about three hours. That was it for some for inst some institutions. We were getting three hours, or for a course of a four year degree, they were getting three hours input in drama education. Um, and um, my own institution, I think we we're four hours. I think we we're getting uh, for them, and that's what they will get in their full four years of education. So I think we're looking about how we're going. But there's, there's an existential crisis right now in the amount of time that's allocated to the arts in undergraduate education, but um, uh, oh, of course uh, PG is for part of that undergraduate, but also about how how they're how they're viewing education so they've got maths and english and literacy all that they're getting that science but then when it's come to the arts they're getting what three hours three four hours in a four-year degree so that tells you then how, what the emphasis and where they're placing value on the, the thing so we as initial teacher educators have a responsibility there as well and we need to start questioning about what it is and how we are designing uh, undergraduate courses to best suit uh, the, the current workforce but again there's Qualities of learning at play, and there's policies at play, and competing factors of time. So but it's about how do we view, and how can we actually view it as a pedagogical approach as well to support our actual initial teacher education uh, at undergraduate level as well for primary education. John, do you want to come in, John Rayner? Uh, <laughs> yeah, just briefly. Um, uh, I I've got a a feeling that none of what we're suffering in the UK is is just ha happening by accident. Uh, it, it's been going on for a very long time, and it's it's um, a drift to, towards a particular ide ideological set of understandings that mm. that are held by the people who govern us. And I think um, drama teachers are, uh, uh, and teachers in general are not very good at 
uh, seeing that picture, seeing that the kind of roots of all of this and how it all fits, in my view, in, into a, a larger pattern of uh, the kinds of other things that we are suffering uh, in society. I mean, I think that the kind of work that you're doing, David, here is is invaluable because for one thing, it enables people who are not aware of the, the fact that there are alternative practices out there to grab hold of them and, and maintain them. When I was working in teacher education, I, I, you know, against sort of all the pressures that were on me, I carried on doing stuff about the history of drama education, about Dorothy and Gavin Bolton and all of those people right up to the current day, because I was realizing that a lot of the teachers that we were placing our students into schools alongside didn't have that understanding. They'd been trained, you know, uh, in the in the in the noughties, uh, very often uh, outside of a university context, and they didn't they didn't have an alternative. Actually, what they what they understood was what they'd been given. Um, so I think what you're doing is, is invaluable because it it keeps the stuff alive. I mean, all the stuff that, that you know, when I came into teaching uh, was current, was very radical, very sharp edged and understood the kind of ideological thrust of uh, the things that we're battling against. And I'm not sure that that's there anymore. So it's self-evident, I think. But um, I think what, what you're doing is is really powerful, but it's got to be backed up you I mean i think uh, you know using the kind of work that jeff's been doing uh with politicians uh and challenging the ideology at all of its levels as many as as much as we can do uh is the way forward and i've just put in my comment a facetious you know comment but we've got to start by getting rid of the current law in england uh who are responsible for a good deal of what we're suffering but I mean, I'm old enough to remember the previous Labour government who actually weren't all that beneficial in, in their attitudes to teach training and drama, drama either, <laughs> in my opinion. So it's, a, it's an ongoing struggle, isn't it? Thanks, John. Yeah, certainly the struggle's got to go on and the conversation's got to go on after this session today. Um, if I can go back to the panel and Theo, Amanda and Will, any final thoughts and comments before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, just to say, sorry. <laughs> just to say, yeah, I agree. Uh, I think you know, Jeff summed it, summed it up really well. Um, and but we have to keep, we have to keep making and creating, and we have to use that as a tool to communicate um, a different vision, a different view of things. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, I've been around a long time, and I know we've been, uh, we've been at it a long time. But, but this, this does feel a particularly sharp time. Uh, but I am very heartened by all, all uh, us being together. Yeah. Yes, I would echo that. I think these meetings, these four are absolutely critical. And it's it's here where we can actually put our melting pot of ideas and hopefully gather the forces that John's been describing so that we can actually, rather than, we're, obviously we're going to have to work in our own silos, but I'm sure we could. There are other ways in which we can actually pull together and make an impact on the system at large. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, what John was saying there, I completely echo with. I mean, the history of drama education is really important. It's important that our students are are aware of that and have an understanding. It was one of the very first lectures I give is about the history of drama education and the different. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, stances and perspective that, that people can take. I think it's really important and I don't know if they get that in school as much as one would hope and they, um, but remember they're not being educated no. at school, you know, so um, they're being educated to teach across uh, the world actually so yeah. and I, I think these are comments that we could then bring forward into Aberdeen and I really welcome you all to Aberdeen next year, <laughs> so please get your hotels booked now uh, because it's expensive Um yeah, so, yeah, please, I really look forward to and welcome you all up to Aberdeen and we can discuss this in greater length up there as well. Yeah, and I think John's right when he talks about the ideology because it's not just arguing for drama or the value of drama. Yeah. It's about a way of thinking about yeah. teaching and learning. Yeah. And yeah. that's really what Dorothy was about. It was about changing the way we think about mm -hmm. teaching and learning and changing our schools. Yeah.
Mm. I want to thank Theo, Amanda and Will for a brilliant session and an important session. And the conversation will continue.